Hello everyone, this is Petko and you're listening to Ratio Talks. This is our series where we meet with interesting people uh, from all fields of uh, science and knowledge. Uh, as usual, this podcast will be in English because as you are probably well aware, we are closing by the date of our Ratio Fall Forum. And as usual, uh, we have a lineup of our guests here uh, for, a, for a conversation. Now, today we're speaking with uh, Roberto Trotta. Roberto, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Roberto, you're a, a lot of things. You know, I was wondering how to introduce you in the beginning, and there are plenty of things uh, to say. Uh, I would just mention a few of them. So you're a, a cosmologist, uh, an astrophysicist, uh, you're a science communicator, you are an author, you are a science consultant, and a data scientist. Uh, what am I missing here? Um, did we mention that I used to cook uh, meals to explain cosmology with food? No, you didn't. You you did that? How, how do you do that? Well, it was an interesting project, to, especially to translate cosmology and uh, astronomy for people with visual impairment and people who cannot see the stars and get them to taste the universe. And I collaborated with a chef to do just that, to create a meal experience that would translate our knowledge of astronomy and the stars for people who have never been able to see them. Oh my God, that sounds... You got to be extremely creative uh, in 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 your approach here. You know, this is like it's it's essentially you're trying to use uh, the culinary art uh, to to convey science. Did it work? I think so. I mean, it was very inspiring. We worked together with with people uh, with visual impairment to to design it in such a way that would make sense to them as well. And so I was very inspired to work with these these people. And uh, you know, I love the stars, I love food, and I, I thought that bringing the two together was the dream project. <laughs> I mean, it does sound interesting, and it reminds me, uh, you know, initially when you said that you used food, I remember uh, this episode of uh, of Cosmos with uh, with Carl Sagan when he mm -hmm. was trying to explain the universe with, like, imagine the universe is a, is this piece of pie. What was it then? Then, then he sliced the piece of pie. Yeah, do, do, do you yeah remember I think that? so. Yeah, I think so. That's what he did, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the different components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, is, uh, is Carl Sagan part of your journey, actually? It's a, it's a pretty universal thing when I speak to people who are, well, like, fond of science. You know, Carl Carl Sagan is uh, occasionally finds uh, his way into into uh, you know people like us, let's yes, say, who are interested yes. in science. Sooner or later, you you, know, you have to sort of uh, confront his legacy of right. great science communication and great science, and so of course, yes, yeah. uh, very much so. And uh, some of the things he did, the iconic things that he did, of course, are part of our not just scientific background but really cultural background. He has really influenced uh, so many of us in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, many, many people forget that he was actually a proper a scientist and you know, oh, yeah. like not only a decent author and a, and a excellent excellent communicator uh well there are some people who have uh, you know taken the torch from him mm. uh right now but i doubt that they will have you know as big of a cultural impact as mm. uh, as, as he had uh well we certainly are trying uh, roberto we're both um, uh, in the same bucket so to say we are uh, both dealing in, in science communication and uh it is a difficult thing to do uh do you occasionally get tired of doing it and what i mean by that is not uh you know it's like like the day-to-day -day, mm. uh hassle of, uh, mm. of 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 trying to do what we do it's just that uh when the objective reality uh like hits you in the face you know when you look at what's going on in the world and mm. uh, in the uk in italy and bulgaria it's mm. like whatever you are mm. it seems like an uphill battle doesn't it? It is an uphill battle. That's absolutely true. But I think the uh, the, the, the tiredness, also the sense of this, uh, you know, sometimes if you, are, you are dismayed that things are seem not to be improving all that much, actually, mm. despite all your best efforts. But then uh, every now and then, you you know, you, you are you are in this in these events, or you meet people, you talk to people, and when when that energy comes back and the enthusiasm, especially in young people, the younger generations, that is it makes it all worth it. Sure. So yeah. I think you know to have that conversation even though you know the wider panorama is is quite worrisome nowadays as we know but you know this the inspiration that science can bring to people's lives uh, i think and, and particularly my kind of science you know astronomy and looking at the universe and the cosmic perspective that that brings i think that's needed more than ever and so when you when you when you, when you feel that love coming back from people yeah. you talk to that makes it all worthwhile Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it's uh, you can you can always rationalize it by saying that you know sing changing a single mind 
is uh, is is worth it you know even a single child you know if you if you can inspire him to to pursue uh, the field of sciences uh, is nice but it, it, as you said you know if you're looking for a bigger like a sociological impact what you just said you know the uh you know, providing or giving the grandeur of of, mm. of the universe that we in, in, inhabit is uh, is actually fundamentally important because we are staring too much into the mundane yes, and indeed. into ourselves. Indeed, and I think that the kind of inspiration, the cosmic inspiration that the stars can provide today is is sorely needed precisely because we confront so many mortal dangers on Earth, climate change, wars, conflicts, runaway artificial intelligence, all this stuff is really, really uh, dire and requires, you know, that we take a cosmic perspective about our place and our time on Earth. And to look at it from the point of view of the stars, I think can be really inspirational and, and really uh, can help us see the big picture, which oftentimes we just uh, forget. Yes. It's funny that we have to be reminded of something that we sort of knew intuitively for you know mm. since, since since we've been around. And um, you actually just uh, just written a book. I, I I checked on the British uh, Amazon website and it was literally published three days ago. Mm, uh, yes. You know, uh, it was added at least into the Amazon uh, market. The book is called Starborn, uh, and. You can you can tell us what is it about? I mean, if you want. Yeah. Yes, uh, Starborn is really is is book coming from from this idea that the stars are very much present in our life, even though we often forget about them all too much. And so, the driving idea of the book is to <coughs> uncover the hidden links between the sight of the stars and human civilization. So, uh, the the book tells the uh, hidden stories of how the, the sight of the stars, the moon, the sun, the planets has shaped the course of humankind from prehistory to to AI and all the ways they've been inspiring, they've been guiding, they've been very much part of us in terms of not just science and technology, of <coughs> course, and astronomy and all the rest, but also in terms of religion, spirituality, um, navigation, timekeeping, psychology. All these aspects are tied to the stars in often unsuspected ways. And Starborn is my attempt to bring forth the deep link that connects us to the cosmic environment all around us. It seems like an examination of something that is very obvious, but now when you are saying it, it it it, it, it doesn't really feel like it. Mm. I mean, if if we have to use a metaphor, it's like a fish doesn't notice the water that it is that it's swimming in, and it defines you know mm. how the fish feels and acts and develops and uh, and 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 it's all it, it's all existence existence. So uh, the stars did have a deep impact on on the human condition and you did say in some unexpected ways can you give us mm. an example yes I, I mean when i started looking into this question it was because i started imagining what would have happened to our world if we had been fated to live on a planet without stars say a planet covered in clouds everywhere at all times and i started realizing that apart from you know this being quite a depressing <laughs> state of affairs and uh, you know from the cultural point of view <laughs> all aspects of civilization would have been different not just the obvious ones, the ones that immediately spring to mind, oh, no stars means you know, no navigation in the high seas, no stars means no moon, and therefore no, no lunar calendars, and no stars means you know, no telescopes uh, pointed to the sky and, and no inspiration uh, for, all, for all sorts of astronomical but uh, scientific investigations as well. But then you know, the deeper I dug, the more hidden stories I found. So for example, one of the most uh, astonishing things that, uh, one, one of the ideas that the book uh, puts forward, one of the most astonishing mm -hmm. discoveries I made while researching the book was that potentially stars have made a difference from the very beginning, from you know the, the dawn of humankind's history when Homo sapiens came out of Africa and uh, met Neanderthals in, in Europe. And the big mystery is why are we here and the Neanderthals who had three, 400,000 years head start on us died out 43,000 years ago, nobody really knows. And the book put, put, forth, the, put forth the hypothesis that actually the stars have a great deal to answer for and our species was better apt at reading the stars, using them for navigation, for timekeeping, for getting together and getting all these cultural exchanges going that the Neanderthals never did. And Therefore, the idea is the stars have, have really <coughs> helped us from 50,000 years ago until today. That is a fascinating hypothesis. It's, uh, I mean, I, I've read plenty of books on, on the topic of why Neanderthals uh, went extinct. I mean, we, it's like we, um, it's like bred with them. Uh, we were more aggressive. We were definitely more organized. We lived mm. in larger groups. Mm. Uh, but the issue of navigation and timekeeping, you know, this this seems uh, uh, when we actually had a, 
you know a few conversations before before that organizational around around the ratio and you um you did mention that uh, we use, you know, stars to organize our 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 daily lives, mm. you know, to for 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 basic timekeeping, and uh, it it really skipped my mind before that how how essential, mm. you know, the the structure of time is for the development of civilization uh, itself, and the stars are the instrument to do that. Yes, and like you said before, you know, like a fish swimming in water, we've forgotten all of that because it's become second nature to us. But now, for two reasons, we we you know we we are no longer aware of it. One is because we don't see them anymore, and of course, yeah. our technology means we are now sort of separated from the stars. Although things like navigation, GPS, for example, is still deep down dependent on on the stars in, in unsuspected ways. But also because you know this this was part of the fabric of our uh, makeup, psychological, cultural makeup, so much so that you forget about it because it's part of what is what it feels like to be mm. human mm. and to actually see it afresh i think is a is a big um, it's a big jolt it can really p- make you perceive you know, our cultural history and our place in the universe from a different uh, perspective now i use uh, you are, you also push partially the thesis that uh, stars are very important in the development of the of the re- of religion as, as we as we know it mm. uh in that sense do you think that you know the religious type of thinking is something that is inherent it's it's part of the our biological uh, nature or it was just uh, a result of an attempt to explain what is it that we're looking up but mm. seeing up there I, I think the explanation part came later really and only in sort of in the second half of the of the second millennium like in, from the scientific revolution onwards you know explanation as we understand it today in terms of scientific rational explanation came only later four sure. five hundred years ago at the beginning you know explanation was not so important I think what was important was inspiration and the mm. fact that this perpetual presence of the sublime like Emerson puts it was out there for everybody to contemplate because if you think about it there is plenty of aspects in nature that are awe inspiring you know sequoia trees or whales mm. or big landscapes but the stars the the canopy of the starry night that's the only common site of nature that's common to all of humankind everywhere right. at all times and it was the common source of inspiration for our earliest spiritual beliefs even the biggest gods always lived in the sky if you think about it yeah yeah true true uh, it's funny when uh, did you look at the youth of uh, of humanity and the way that we mm. that we saw things and 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 try to understand them and to compare it with the with our personal journeys you mm. know it seems like on a grander scale on a personal scale it's it's pretty much the same the same journey so i'm i'm, I'm curious you're, you're a scientist right mm. now and i'm i'm doing science communication uh you're way more educated than i am uh but i would assume that we we had a, a sort of a the same um uh, path, so to say. So mm. uh, I used to believe, like, well, I was like, very convinced that the pyramids were built by aliens, for example. Mm. Uh, you know, then I became, I, I read Marx, I became a socialist, then I became Hayek, and I became like a, like a capitalist. And mm-hmm. then uh, it was all, you know, radical, radical views, mm. uh, you know, changing throughout the years. Uh, and, and at some point, I reached like a, a point of balance. You know, mm. it's like I'm, I'm I'm sort of uncertain about anything. You know, and, and <laughs> radical it's, uh, uncertitude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 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 I'm curious. What was your journey? Did you mm. used to like intuitively believe in things that are obviously pseudo scientific and and are not uh, you know supported by any mm. evidence and 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 you still believe them? I mean, can you give us an example? Like mm. like draw us a, a line from your childhood till today. Well, I, I think. Specific to do with the stars, I think the, 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 I was lucky enough to grow up in in the southern part of Switzerland, which mm-hmm. was still quite dark and and therefore quite open to being inspired by the the, the the darkness of the night sky and and to the sense of wonder and curiosity about you know what, what what's out there. And so that is what has driven my path in terms of my professional path mm-hmm. to becoming uh, to becoming an astrophysicist and and uh, and, uh, and and then later to trying to, uh, to transmit and and translate that enthusiasm for for others. Uh, but but of course, you know, when you grow up, I think there is all of this magical aspect of childhood that is very, very important. And, you know, the fact that, <clears throat> that, that you believe in all sorts of things, you believe in, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in magical things uh, that happen to you. And that aspect of magic, while when, when you grow up, 
I think it's important to keep it inside. Of course, that's no longer part of my job because sure. my job is about dissecting things in a rational and scientific and mathematical way. But to, to, keep, to keep open your heart and your mind, that sense of wonder that the universe is wonderful in a way that science uh, isn't because science is wonderful in a different kind of way. It's a different right. approach. And so the two things complement each other. And so to, to keep that childlike wonder at the universe alive while at the same time, you know, using cold and, and, and sort of cold head scientific method to investigate the universe. Those are two very different ways of experiencing the same sense of beauty and marvel of the, of the fact that A, the universe is out there and B, that we're part of it. And in some sense, we can even grasp some small or big aspects of it. Yeah. And so the two things I think are not necessarily in conflict and they can they can they can be two different aspects of the same wonder. Yeah and, and well they sound they sound like a like a prerequisite for a scientist to be, mm. uh, you know, to develop and explore new ideas. You have to be open-minded and, and and be open to exploring ideas that they don't have, uh, you know, any objective kind of evidence, evidence mm. uh, supporting it. It's funny uh, that it's, it sounds like a very difficult thing to do, to, yes. be, to be honest. Yes, and especially because, you know, modern science is is very much about, uh, you know, it's, it's radical positivism and, and, you know, trying really to dissect things to their smallest atoms and smallest components in order to understand them at that microscopic level. But we see now many of the challenges in science and in physics and astronomy are about complexity. And complexity is less amenable to that kind of positivistic, deterministic approach where you just you know, chop it up in smaller, smaller chunks, yes. and then you build it back up. So, some things are fundamentally um, uh, uh, fundamentally connected in a way that you cannot just separate them. And so, to have that bigger sweep of of a view, also scientifically, becomes more and more important as we see all the big problems that we're facing nowadays. And questions are inherently cross disciplinary, and therefore they do need this you know bigger vista. Otherwise, you just miss important aspects of them if you try to boil them them down too much too early. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it feels like the clock is turning back when uh, we used to have these lone scientists. Uh, I mean, you, you are Italian. You know, it's, mm. it's like the, uh, the the classical view of a scientist is like a single uh, genius person in a lab mm. uh, uh, who is a polymath. Essentially, mm. you know, mm. it's it, and and they know everything that is to know mm. out there, and you know, trying to connect these ideas to explain uh, a, a a single a single phenomenon. Uh, then we got into the field of specialization, you know, mm. in, in which everyone was uh, again folks focused on a, on a smaller field, and now we have this change of the paradigm again, in which you have mm. to combine all the mm. fields of knowledge in order to make sense of the complexity. Yes, as you as you as you said. Oh. But I think I think today is, is fundamentally different from you know the Renaissance uh, polymath right in, in two different ways. Which one, one is that of course during the Renaissance all of these scientists or proto scientists were all men. Yeah. Nowadays, fortunately, this is no longer the case. We're working hard to make science more gender balanced and more mm. inclusive, which is a very very important aspect. And secondly, you know of course now the body of knowledge is so immense that you know so vast that it's very very difficult to straddle even just two sub disciplines of a field. And so that takes uh, real effort, and and that's even more important. And therefore, to build cross-disciplinary teams where everybody brings their own expertise and try to build bridges across. And so working together across discipline, to me, is is the key to, to solving many of the problems yes. that science and society has got today. And, and definitely feels like it's, uh, it's, it's, it's already needed to leverage all the technology that we have. Uh, it, it already feels like there, is, there isn't a single podcast out there that doesn't talk about AI, so, but it's inevitable to cover mm. this because it's very important in the field of, yes. uh, of science. So big data, uh, AI, uh, how is that going to, to change the, the scientific field, do you think? Well, I think AI can be transforma transformational if it's used in the right way as, as, as a tool that we understand and rather than just the black box that, that spits out answers. And, you know, in my, in my current job as, as head of data science at, at the advanced uh, uh, school, for, that school for advanced studies in, in uh, Trieste, Italy, we try to do just that, to develop AI and machine learning tools that will be able to give us not just, you know, the answer, but also give us insight into that answer. Because ultimately what we are after is scientific knowledge. And mm -hmm. scientific knowledge is always ab not just about the what, but it's also about the how, and even perhaps some Sometimes about the why, and to build AI tools that are able to help us in this kind of path to discovery is not obvious. Um, and so that's why we are really focused on, on these AI tools, because also the data that we have about the universe, for example, are so vast, so complex, the more traditional analysis methods are now failing or mm. getting to the limits of their abilities. And if used in the right way, I think AI will be a huge, huge help for, 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 for scientists uh, now and in the future. 
uh, now when when you were talking about all that, uh, and I remember the the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't know if you mm. if you if you read the book. One of my definite favorites, and my son is reading it right now. He's giggling, you know, and it's <laughs> so it's it's cool. He gets it, uh, and I, I I remember there that you know the the, the essentially the the idea that Douglas Adams puts forward is that we uh, will leverage like higher intelligence and uh, like we can call it a AI general AI whatever we want but just a higher intelligence not only to figure out the answers but to figure out what is the right question yes. that we that we need to ask is that is that the more more more, more difficult thing to do in science yeah yeah i think and so far certainly the AI tools that we have are not up to that more difficult task which remains you know an essential part of human creativity and human insight and there are some efforts in that direction but um i, I don't think we're quite there maybe we'll never get there uh, the, because all of these generative ai tools the chat gpts etc they're fantastic at providing answers for things that have been already trained <clears> on <throat> but to take that fundamental step towards a new level of insight about the physical reality of the world that's something that for now at least remains the the, the domain of human creativity and which is probably not bad in a sense yes <laughs> are you a speciesist <laughs> 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 you want to keep it a, as, a, as a human domain you know ex- exclusively well let's say that there are some things that uh, you know I think it's 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 appropriate and 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 because they're defining of what it is to be human you know and if we give them away to the machines I think we, we're going to be uh, poorer humans in, yeah. in that respect so I think yeah. some things I still want to do myself <laughs> yes I mean I, I often argue with friends about that it's like you gotta let it go man you know yeah. it's like it's the next step of evolution it's like why do humans even matter it's like are you kidding me <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it, it might not be logical uh, or uh, anything but of course i'm on team human i right. mean it's it's yes. uh, that there is something very important and interesting about us you know yeah. we are a complete mess you know as a, no, as, a, as a species but still we are so extremely rare and interesting that preserving us i think it's uh, it's it's important and, and there's yeah. nothing to say that you know if, if ai takes over hopefully not but if general ai takes over then there's nothing to say that ai will be any better than us sure so, right he so. might be an asshole as well yeah. <laughs> or worse super, or super worse. intelligent <laughs> absolutely yeah uh, well speaking of the uh, of the big questions mm. that are uh, currently in the in mostly in the human human domain what are these difficult questions for you i think one of the biggest one is really at the heart of what you know really is out there 95% of the universe we now suspect or we now know with reasonable certainty is dark <coughs> invisible made of dark matter dark energy and we have very little clue about what that is about so you know the, all these you know, fantastic pictures of the deep sky that we see from the space telescopes or the telescopes on earth all the shiny galaxies everything that's out there is only 5% of the total yeah. so the really big question is what is the rest right dark matter dark energy what are they and even perhaps you know why is the universe balance and 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 cosmic recipe set up this way and could yeah. it have been any other way those are very deep questions about the nature of reality uh you know i i often hear that and it's uh I realize that understanding the 95% that we don't understand of how the universe works is uh, is is fundamentally important mm. but I fear that the moment we figure it out it might be boring. Or you think that the universe will disappear the moment we figure it out? <laughs> uh, yeah yeah and, and a more complex will pop up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like again no. the hitchhiker uh, Yeah exactly. Uh, I guess what I mean is that uh yeah we will finally un- finally you know uncover mm. what is dark energy and what is dark matter mm. uh is just that from the perspective of a non astro uh, astrophysicist mm. or a, or a scientist uh i re- again i realize that it's important mm. for our understanding of how the universe functions and it works and and where it will go but it seems fundamentally boring to me well it depends what the answer is right we don't yeah. know what the answer might be it might be that this is just the, the tip of the iceberg and you know like at the end of the uh, 19th century people thought oh physics is finished you know yeah. now it's only you know a little bit around the edges and then quantum mechanics came along and the relativity came along and it was a revolution right so it might well be that we misunderstand fundamentally what the question is and when we actually figure out what the mistake is we, this will inaugurate a new a new era of discoveries so sure. it's not entirely sure that it's going to be as boring as that probably not you know i yeah uh, but i mean b- what do you reckon? I mean, what is what is your craziest idea in this regard? Oh, I think I think yeah, exactly that. That you know, we'll at some point we'll, we'll find out that what we think this ninety five percent is made of is entirely misguided. Maybe the observations are being misinterpreted in some fundamental way, and and that will completely change our view of, about the universe. And, and that will be quite quite a revolution in physics, but also in 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 our understanding of you know everything really around us. And if that's 
uh, not sufficiently revolutionary. I think the next big thing in the next 10 years, certainly in our lifetime, will be the discovery of life elsewhere in yeah. the universe, because that 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 is almost certainly coming sooner or later. I think life is probably abundant in the galaxy, actually, and it's quote unquote only a question of, of finding it yeah. uh, around us. Yeah. Well, when you put it like that, yes. I mean, certainly it will be, if we finally understand what dark energy and dark matter is, and it changes the our fundamental understanding of how things work, mm. uh, this, of course, relates to us. I mean, we are part of this material universe. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's worth thinking about, but definitely the problem uh, or the question with alien life forms is more interesting to, 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 to me. Oh, know, that's, that's one that I think would be absolutely sort of revolutionary from also a point of view of our own understanding, you know, from even, you know, the, you know, everybody, the moment when we have positive evidence of yeah. the fact that there is life elsewhere in the galaxy. I mean, that, that changes fundamentally things for just about anybody, right? Mm. I mean, it's as fundamental as the shift of perspective that the Copernican system brought about. The Earth was no longer at the center of the universe. And to find out that we're not the only living planet in, in the universe is, is massive. So are you saying that we, we have both a theoretical and an engineering problem? Uh, if, we, if we're speaking about a massive shift in our mm. understanding of a, of a scientific revolution on the scale of like the Copernican revolution or Einstein or the quantum physics mm. revolution, uh, why we haven't reached the next stage yet? Well, it's down to technology. We didn't have mostly, the means, mostly, yes. until... until so know. the mathematics is there. Yes, I mean, yes, like yes. And, and, and the statistics is there as well. You know, the, 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 the fact that, you know, we can sort of work out what is the probability of life in a galaxy, given what we know now about the uh, predominance of solar systems around other stars. We now think that about 50% of the 300 billion stars in the galaxy have got a solar system going around them. So that it's enormous amount of opportunity yeah. for life to arise. But we we didn't have the means until recently to actually, you know, inspect the light from these other stars so closely enough to be able to tell whether there were planets. Now we can do that routinely, but and now we're, you know, going to the next stage, which is, you know, we can do now weather forecasts on planets around other stars, and soon we will be able to look for the signatures of life on those in the atmosphere of those planets, and that's that's massive. And we didn't just didn't have the means of doing that until very very recently, but now that we can, it's only a question of numbers, you know, just yeah. looking at enough candidates until we find the right one. It's funny, I, I wonder whether there is any tension between like theoretical physics mm. and, um, you know, the engineers, essentially. It's mm. like, it's like, come on, guys, let's figure out how to test this thing out. You right, know? It's like, right. Because I have, it, I have it on paper, it makes sense. We need observations, we need, we need to go there. It's like, it's like come on. You know, well, but those are hard questions, right? I mean, and, yeah. and theoretical physicists can be very, very patient. You know, Einstein uh, wrote down the predictions for gravitational waves in 1960, and it took 100 years to find them. So 100 years yeah. is a long time, and it's a very, very difficult measurement. So, you know, we're, we're pushing the engineers and the experimental physicists as hard as we can, but, and they're doing their very best, but those yeah. are very, very tall orders and it's a very difficult thing to do. So mm. it's quite, you know, it's quite remarkable that it's even possible to, to do so. You know, imagine, you know, we've got planets thousands of light years away that are, you know, really specks in the immensity of the cosmos and we're able to gather the, the light going through their atmospheres, we're able to analyze it, we're able to tell whether, you know, there, there's clouds or fair weather, what is the composition of the atmosphere and eventually, you know, what living things might be on those planets and across the vastity of space. It's, it's an incredible feat and uh, the fact that it's becoming routine shouldn't make it sound any, any easier than it is because yeah. it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And it, you did say that 100 years is a lot, but we also need to appreciate it in the grand scale mm. of things. It's it's nothing. I no, mean, it's that's like right. we, we are doing things very quickly. It's just that I want them to be quicker because I'm going to be dead in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. But again, the cosmic perspective of the timescale <clears> of the stars <throat> is useful in, in appreciating how, you know, how much Homo sapiens has, has changed and evolved over a course of a very tiny part of, yeah. of what it is, the, the cosmic story. There is a, a beautiful image in John McPhee's uh, book, which I, I use also in, in, my, in, book, in my own book, Starborn, about you know, how to put into perspective how little do we cover in terms of, of, of uh, deep time. And so he says, you know, if, you, if you stretch out your arms as wide as they go, and, and, and let's say that this is the, the, the span of history from the moment when the earth was formed until today, if you pass a single time uh, a nail file on your nails, in that, in that little powder that comes off your, the tip of your nails, that's the entirety of human 
civilization, yeah. it's in there, right? We are nothing compared to the time scale of deep time. And, and therefore it's even incredible that we are, you know, we are here to be able to talk about it and to understand, you know, all of this incredible span of cosmic history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the grand scale of things, we haven't been around for a long time. Uh, it's been quite, uh, you know, quite, <laughs> quite quick actually. And but it does feel like we don't have much time as well. You know, it's mm. like I don't know. Uh, you know, since I became a parent, I became uh, um, inevitably I'm an existential optimist because I don't have a choice. Mm. Yeah, you know, but still, uh, I fear that we might be running out of time. But but, but, but before we go into this, I, I want to go back to the. Um, to the state of science and imagine uh, that we live in a world in which you have massive investment in mm. scientific uh, mm. study uh, and in the scientific field globally. Mm. Will that change things? Again, I'm trying to uh, to pinpoint what is the uh, uh, the problem there. I mean, science is obviously developing at a very mm. fast pace. Yes, yes, yes. But in order to achieve things that it seems like we need to mm. very soon, mm. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. what does it take? I mean, do we have, again, a theoretical, an engineering, or a funding problem? I think what, so if you're referring to things like, you know, climate change and the state of the world at large and the yeah. conflicts that arise, I think those are not necessarily scientific problems. Of course, we yes. do need science. We do need engineering. If you want to do, you know, new carbon neutral economy anytime soon, we need, you know, massive investment in technologies that, right. you know, partially we have, partially we don't have, but, you know, we certainly have the means of doing that. But what is missing is not the understanding of, you know, the science of climate change. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily the technology to do that shift to carbon neutral economy. What is missing is political will. Sure. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and so it's, it's less, in my opinion, <clears throat> a scientific technological problem, although there is some of it as well, but rather the fact that the, the fruits of the scientific revolution and the technological advances that we've seen in the last 50 years have not been shared equally mm. across the globe and actually have led to massive polarization and massive um, uh, uh, disparity in yep. incomes and quality of life. And so I think we haven't seen nearly as much of a progression in the way we organize society uh, that has has not matched at all what the, yeah. our power of actually influencing the, the world, the environment, all around us as, as, as the, the big strides that this has made in the last hundred years. So we need to catch up, not very much in terms of science and technology, but catch up with you know, the ability to to use that science and technology for the greater good of, of the entire planet. That is not a scientific problem. It's, yeah. it's a, a fundamentally human problem, I think. Right, right. It, it does feel like in the, in the last, uh, I don't know, let's put a time scale on it. Like a hundred years, we've been living in a scientific revolution and a social stagnation. Indeed. You know, and then they, they do have to happen at the same time. I, I definitely agree on that. But uh, if we are talking about like more difficult problems, like, uh, um, I don't know, it's like healing death, let me put it this mm. way, or becoming an interplanetary species. Mm. Mm. Will investment do the job? So I have a, I have a, a perhaps a slightly uh, contrarian view to, to the, for example, to the interplanetary species okay. idea, right? This idea that, you know, you should back up life mm -hmm. and, and go elsewhere to Mars first and then colonize the galaxy because that's the long-term destiny of humankind. And and also because people say, if you do that, you know, that's, that's uh, the, you know, in case we mess up things here at home, we have another planet to go to. And I think that's a very dangerous idea. A, a because it's not technologically feasible right now and it won't be for a long time to come. And we've got <clears> many <throat> other problems that we need more ur urgently to solve here on this planet. And second, because I believe there is no planet B. You know, we make mm. our stand here on this blue spaceship that we inhabit. And this idea that there is somehow a backup planet out there that we can all escape to, it's just fantasy. It's science fiction. It's not going to happen. And it's actually very dangerous because it diverts attention from the urgent problems that we were discussing earlier, you know, the things that we need to solve here on this planet. And if we think that, well, you know, if we end up obliterating the planet through climate change or nuclear catastrophe or whatnot, well, it doesn't really matter because we can all go move on to somewhere else. Mm. That's not going to happen. It's yeah, but sure, not going to happen. But, but but purely historically or geologically, if you mm. will, from the history of our planet, uh, don't you think that a mass extinction is inevitable, whether we do it or an asteroid does it, or you know, like massive volcanic eruptions do true, it? It's like true, true. But the timescales, consider the timescales. We we've been talking about you know Homo sapiens and Neanderthals fifty thousand years ago. Fifty thousand years is nothing right in, compared to the timescales we are talking about. And civilization has been around for what 
six, seven thousand years, maybe at the stretch. That seems like a long time to you and I, but it's a very short time on on on, on the time scale of evolution and, mm. and planetary time scales. And so, you know, to imagine that we can control our destiny in the future, you know, over time scales that span, you know, tens and hundreds or millions, thousands or, or millions of years, it's it's completely misguided. Because the, the truth of the matter is, if we don't solve the problems that we have in the next 10, 50, 100 years, which is a very short time scale over which none of the other catastrophic uh, dangers really matter, not the, not the you know, evolutionary dangers and so on, all the dangers that we're facing are essentially anthropogenic now. Mm. It, we are, are our, our own creation. Right. We need to solve them first before we can even worry about <clears throat> You know those, those bigger timescales, and so I think it's really a question of you know focusing on on the urgent needs and the urgent issues before being able to worry about you know what what's going to happen to the humankind in hundred thousand years. Well, that's not a question. We need to worry about what's going to happen in the next ten years, yeah, and next hundred years, and to make sure that we are still there after that. Well, it seems like we're tempted to think of a technological solution or mm. like like escapism because it seems to be the easier task. Mm. Because what you're talking about is a fundamental political, psychological, sociological yes. uh, change. And uh, we started our conversation with the idea that uh, it seems like an uphill battle. And if we assume that, you know, a majority of the problems that we're facing is uh, uh, not because people are necessarily evil, they're just stupid sometimes you know it's just it's just plain stupidity you know uh how do we how do we f fix that for christ's sake well i think first of all science and technology will certainly be part of the answer don't, don't right. get me wrong so this is re really important like the transition to a, a more carbon neutral economy you know requires a great deal of that but uh I, I think to to just lean back and thinking oh you know uh, technology will save us and we we're going to be able to fix it all with technological advance i think that's that's a false hope and it's one mm. that's easy to have but it's it's it hides the reality that the hard task is precisely what you just described the fact that you know people have to become more conscious of you know are each and every one's part in creating all these problems and, and, and try to work together to solve them. That's where the stars, I think, come back in, right? This cosmic perspective, if we can see ourselves and which is something that hap happens a lot to people who go to or orbit, go to space, astronauts going to the moon, turning back, seeing this blue planet floating in the darkness of space. And they they often have what is called the overview effect, mm. this idea that, you know, we are alo not alone, but we are certainly very vulnerable in on this blue spaceship in the middle of, of nothing. If we could share more of, more of that insight, the, which often has changed lives uh, across the planet, I think we will be better off. So I think the stars and the perspective of the stars can bring about, you know, more awareness mm. for the uniqueness of our cosmic time and our cosmic presence on this planet and that can help shift attitudes towards what needs to be done i think that's a part of the solution as well it is part of the solution i, I just don't see it um scaled up mm. you know to a degree that would be sufficient well maybe i mean maybe mm. maybe at some point everybody who is making any important decisions about mm. other people's lives should mm. go up there right, you know, right. Like it should be a yes. prerequisite it's yes. like you go to space yes. you know before space, you become I'm... a politician or whatever you know it's <laughs> like and then you come back and and then think of people yeah. uh, but you know fixing fixing these uh, uh again like psychological cultural ethical questions mm. that we are all facing do you do you think that because you, you you're working in in the field of astrophysics and mm. in physics you're working with numbers mm. you know everything uh is uh is concrete it's specific it's predictable it's mm. calculable more uh, or less more or less <laughs> of course yes um Whereas when we when we speak about societies, you know, these are extremely complex systems mm. that, uh, and and this is the reason why like fields like social psychology and economics are often described as pseudo scientific mm. because they're not uh, yet at the at the level of physics in mm. terms of predicting, mm. you know, mm. what is what is what is going to happen. Mm. So, do you think that the answer that that, that science could be an instrument mm. to actually address? you know, these ethical, cultural, and, and all other problems. And mm. I realize that this is a controversial topic because mm. historically we try to apply, yes. you know, scientific yes. thinking yes. and fixing yeah. cultural and, and, and other, and yeah. other issues. It didn't turn out it well. It didn't really work. And, yeah. and actually, historically, come to think about it, you know, that's, that's also part of the insights that I, I, I had while writing my book. You know, it seems like so social psychology, for example, actually were born out of insights that were first gleaned among the stars. And there's a deal of prediction and uncertainty and, and the fact that 
that you know measurement errors fo follow a certain uh, law, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the distribution of uh, normal errors, for example, from Gauss and Laplace. That was the direct inspiration for the work of Ketley and others that led to social sciences oh, and, wow. and psychology. So, in fact, you know whatever we whatever we have in terms of yeah. scientific study of of sociology and psychology actually does go back to the stars. Another hidden link yeah. between you know the cosmic environment and 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 life on Earth, and. Yes, it works to a point, but like you say, you know, human beings are far more complex and far more complicated than atoms or stars or yeah. galaxies. And so, you know, physics in that respect is easy because an electron is an electron is an electron, while you and I are people, but we're all different, mm -hmm. right? So so some regularities can be gleaned, but not sufficiently, I don't <laughs> think, for them to ever be exploited. And, and although now, of course, we see with AI, you know, that, and the data collection capability of the big companies and governments that, you know, even though we don't have a theory of how things work, you, you can have very pre pre precise prediction mm. and algorithms that can actually nudge you in many different ways, which you might think, oh, well, that's that, that could be useful to, you know, to help people become better people. But actually what we see is actually it's being used for, for yeah. nudging people in very different directions that are not necessarily towards a common good, but they are, you know, in, in, in help you click more and buy more on, on online or perhaps vote for this candidate or that candidate. So that this, this idea of control, which was also born among the stars, is turning into dystopian control. Mm. So in that sense, I think the kind of, let's not call it science, but sort of predictive power of algorithms and AI today, if anything, is making matter worse because it's individually tailored to nudge people to do things that are in the interest of, well, Someone whoever else, is yeah. doing the nudging, right? Right, so, yeah. yeah. Very dangerous stuff. But do you think, uh, again, I'm gonna step into the controversial here. I'm sorry for putting you, for putting you on the spot. It's, uh, don't you, don't you think that there are some things from an ethical uh, point of view that are that are objectively true? Mm. Uh, meaning that that we can we can define what is good for an individual and mm. what is good for a society. We can clearly define them. Well, maybe not as clear as mm. as, as we do in mm. physics, but we can use a working definition. Let's say uh, alleviation of suffering is mm. something that we mm. want to do, mm. and then leveraging. The tools mm. of uh, like big data, mm. nudging, all mm. of that. Uh, I remember the saying that you know, in, in in order for the good to win against the evil, the angels need to organize like the mafia. <laughs> uh, so, do you think that it's sometimes worth it to use these otherwise diabolical tools <laughs> that are affecting our society in such a negative ways in order to actually have a positive change on the world the, or I think, not? I, I think the problem is, you know, when it, when it comes to really defining what you mean by positive change and, mm -hmm. and, and overall good, it becomes a fiendishly difficult question. Yes. And when you start getting down to actually algorithmically defining what does it mean, you know, to have overall good outcomes, mm -hmm it becomes an impossible problem. And, you know, d depending on your definition of good, yes, you might want to optimize this or that outcome. Uh, and, in actu and actually there are theorems, for example, in algorithmic um, uh, design of AI systems where, you know, you want to be fair. You know, everybody can agree that being fair is, is a good thing, but then how do you define algorithmic fairness? Do you want to be fair to individuals? Do you want to be fair to groups? Do you want to be fair uh, so that, you know, if you've got the same characteristic as somebody else, there is no disparity in the outcome? Do you want to be fair? You know, women and men have to have the same outcome. And it turns out, depending on, there's a long list of possible definition of being fair or, you know, or, or actually good outcomes. And there's a mathematical theorem that shows that the outcome outcomes are incompatible. So depending right. on your definition of what it means to be <clears throat> fair, or what it means to be good, you might be able to achieve that definition, but by definition, it will be unfair or not so good in another per person's view, if they have a different def uh, definition of view, and you cannot do the two things at the same time. And so when it boils down to that definition, you, you find out that who decides, right? Yeah. yeah. The people who have the algorithm, the people who have the data, <clears throat> government, you know, some precedent, you know, who decides? Yeah. And, and so, it, it becomes very quickly dystopian. So I, my view is actually that while the idea, you know, in principle seems to be a good idea, when you start trying to put it in practice, the hurdles and the actual practical algorithmical technical difficulties are such that they not just nullify the goodness of the idea, but almost invariably they led to a worse outcome, an outcome that for somebody it's got to be worse. Yeah. And so it becomes impossible to actually use it in a way that everybody would agree, oh, that's a good outcome. Yeah. So it boils down to the very old, you know, negotiation and talking and discussing and right. getting multiple people's view. I think algorithms cannot do that because they are designed to optimize this one thing. And mm -hmm. whatever that one thing is, 
you know, it's going to be different from you and I, and it's and it's right to be so. It it, it ought to be so. It has to be so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah, uh, when you look at it like that, you you start realizing why is it difficult to do public policy. Mm. Yeah, it's it's mm. like leveraging this these different interests, and at some point you realize that. Um, human suffering seems to be a prerequisite of doing anything you know mm. it's like a, 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 there will always be somebody who is mm. paying the price for something so there is no scientific or technological solution it's uh, we rely on the good old social evolution i think i think that you know it's like yeah. i say science has to be part of the solution and there are some things where it can help and yeah. has to help but to rely on it as to being the panacea that will solve sure. it all for us, I think that's misguided. It's putting on science a, a burden that science was never designed to address. You know, right. it's it's it, it's a different question. It's a question about how do we organize ourselves as humans? And science is but one of, of aspects of human life. It's a human activity. Science itself has got its flaws. Scientists themselves, we're not perfect. We're not entirely rational. You know, we fight like everybody else for, you know, recognition, citations, and, and, and pride, and so on. Um, so, you know, there are some specific and very good things about science and technology, but they're not necessarily the answer to all of our societal problems. We need, we need you know, to engage in a different way with each other and, and find, fi find again that sense of you know, common purpose that we, are, we seem to have lost very much in, uh, in the last you know, 20 years, for sure. Do you think that if we actually leverage the, the, the most powerful tool of science, which is you know, the scientific method, the way mm. of thinking mm. uh, that uh, that science is based on, mm. uh, that if we apply it on an individual and in a, on, a, on a collective level, this will make a, the world a better place. For, cert for certain things, for yeah. sure, right? Uh, but let's, let's recall that being you know, sort of applying the scientific method is a very unnatural thing to do sure. in a sense, because, you know, it, it took us a long time to figure it out. And even now, you know, it's it's hit and miss sometimes, and it takes a lot of effort to actually apply consistently. So I don't think this is necessarily something that everybody will ever be able to take on or want to take on in their life as a way of looking at the world. And like I said before, it's one sliver is one way of looking at the world that's incredibly effective if you're trying to study the Big Bang or the structure of proteins or, you know, fight diseases mm. and and find a cure for, for, for all sorts of illnesses, that's, that's exactly what you want to be doing. But if you want to organize society around it, I think that leads necessarily to some, some sort of dystopia whereby you know, it's a technocracy. And, yeah. and human life is, is not all about technology and it's not all about science, it's not about, all about rationality either. And there are many aspects of, our, of, of, of leading and living a good life that are not necessarily scientific and should not be necessarily put into that one box. And so reminding ourselves of the power of science is absolutely fundamental at the same time, also making sure that we, we keep other perspectives as well and the way to interact to each other, with each other is equally vital. And so to boil it down to this one dimensional plane, I think it would be probably uh, too much. Yes, and I think uh, in the beginning, b before we actually started recording, we were talking about our kids. Mm. And it is uh, very tempting, and I'm trying to do that with my kids when they were especially younger. When they ask a question, I'm trying to give them like the straight answer, you know, the straight scientific answer. It's like, are they monsters? You know, it's like, no. You know, it's like, there is no proof that they're monsters. And, and it's tempting to do that. And at some point, I realized that you robbed them yes. out of... Uh, out of, a, uh, of, of an illusion that is absolutely necessary to live yes. a good and interesting life. Yes. You know, yes. So at, at some point I started like, yeah, of course most of us exist. It's just they exist in a different realm that doesn't touch as ours. Indeed. You know, so you can Indeed. live in both worlds. You know? And I'm trying to, to sort of juggle with both, both, of, these, both of these things. It, it seems like an illusion. Mm. Uh, having a, uh, having a, an illusion mm. uh, is, is, is a really something necessary for a good life, isn't it? Yes, it's the magic that we were talking about earlier. Right, this childlike magic of the world and, and, the, and the sense of wonder that if you become too analytical, you, you just dispel it too much. And mm -hmm. then you're robbed of something that's fundamental about our being in the world. And so things like dreams, for example, are not necessarily, are certainly not scientific, and, and they, but they can be analyzed or can be understood in a way that makes your life richer, in a way that uh, I think uh, m yeah, makes your life a, a, a more interesting life, even though they're not part of my scientific uh, work and I would never analyze them in a way that I do you know, 
data from distant galaxies, but at the same time are part of the experience of being human. And, and, and you know, being a scientist is one of those experiences. I'm also a father, I'm a husband, I'm you know, a member of a, of a football club or whatever it might be. And those are different ways of being human that make my life better, richer and, and more enjoyable. Certainly, yeah. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation, we uh, I, I spoke about my, my my personal journey of being like radical in different possession. Mm. You know, it's then at some point I became like a radical atheist. You know, it's mm. like this is absurd. Are you kidding me? You know, it's like mm. there is no God. There is no. Uh, and, and then and and the temptation to uh, spread the gospel of mm. rationalism and uh, you know of science and the and, gospel. And, though you said it, the gospel. <laughs> yes, I just said the gospel. Yes, uh, and 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 spreading it and then being radical mm. about it. Mm. You know, with the mm. full conviction that you are mm. doing a good thing. Mm. Mm. And at some point, I realized this is so childish and stupid, and 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 so unnecessary and mm. un, un, unhelpful. Mm. You know, and 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 eventually, I came down. You know, it's like it balances out. You know, now I believe in the. God of Spinoza, for example, it's like, the, or or uh, at least I accept, you know, certain mm. possibility, mm. Uh, and and realizing that taking taking away, you know, these things from you know, from people by mm. forcibly feeding them the idea that no. they are stupid and non rational is the wrong way to go. Mm. And maybe the problem here, and if we're speaking about science communication in general, mm. is that we hear very few. Uh, like balanced voices. Mm. It's like I don't. I don't know how is it in the in the UK, mm. but here in Bulgaria, it's if if we have people you know working in in in, in the science communication, the mm. skeptical field, so to say, mm -hmm. yeah, it feels like they're very radical mm. all the time in mm. their in their message. So, mm. No God, you're stupid. Mm. You know, it's like mm. homeopathy. You're mm. stupid. Mm. You know, it's like it's mm. like assigning mm. uh, certain qualities to the people yeah. that believe yeah. it. it yeah. That doesn't seem to be the effective way to go. No, about it. no, I think like you say, it's not effective because people just stop listening. Yeah, you won't convince them of, of anything at all. So from a science communication perspective, it's simply not the right yeah. way of communicating. But I, I think as our conversation has already made clear, I think it's not, it's not, it's not even a good way necessarily of, of living your life, to putting all of your eggs in the, in the scientific basket and, and right. look at the world through that one perspective. And, and it's a question of respect, respecting other people's views as well and other people's beliefs. They might not be yours, mm. but at the same time, those are beliefs that people are, you know, identify with. And they have a very rich culture tradition, you know, for thousands of years, going back to what we were saying before, you know, looking at the stars has inspired all sorts of spiritual beliefs in people. And, you know, the temptation is now to say, oh, you know, this was so silly, you know, why think about the Milky Way as a, as a, as a road to for, for uh, departed souls to go into heavens? It's just a collection of gas and stars out there. Yes, we know this, but, you know, if you actually go out and look at the Milky Way with your own eyes and you forget about all of this for a moment, it's still beautiful. It's still awe-inspiring. It's, it's still something that you can totally understand why people believe that in, yeah. in the past. And, and that's an experience that's worth having. And so I think it's, it's not effective and it's not useful. It's not even um, uh, a good thing to do to try to just steamroll people's beliefs with, and science tells us, yes, science tells us this, but there's nothing stopping you from going out and looking at the beauty of the night sky and just enjoying it for what it is, a very inspiring view that has you know, really connected us for thousands of, of years and hundreds of generations to our ancient uh, prehistoric uh, ancestors. And that's a beautiful thing in itself. It is. It is. I'm so glad that we uh, we had you on the on the podcast and and that we will have you on the Ratio Forum. Now, the the moment that this airs, it's uh, it's already going to be in the past. Uh, but I mean, what are what are some other things? I mean, it, except you know, looking at the grand picture, just look up in the sky. Mm. What else would you would you would you say say to people? I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity of a last word, word because yeah, we have a tradition. We're going to kill you in the back room, I guess. You know, I don't, I don't know why I do this. <laughs> <laughs> so my no, my advice is, is definitely this: uh, to uh, open your eyes and open your eyes to the world that surrounds us. That could be you know Jupiter and the moon in the sky, but it could also be you know a drop of water in mm. the morning on a on, on a leaf, and 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 that world we often take for granted and we just forget about the beauty of the of the planet that we live on, uh, or, or oftentimes we just experience it through screens and, and, and mediated means, but uh, we forget to be, that we are embodied beings that are in, in a, on, a, on a fantastic blue spaceship in, in the immensity of the cosmos. And whatever way you find to be able to reconnect with that experience, I think will make your life richer and, and more meaningful. It seems like you're saying, it's like, find your inner kid. 
you know, it's like don't yes. be scared to play with your mind and with the uh, uh, with with the things around you. Exactly, childlike is good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Your book was Starborn, Starborn with the subtitle "How the Stars uh, Made Us and Who We Would Be Without Them." All right. Well, congratulations on your book, and I'm looking for you forward for your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right.